Welcome to Not Your Ordinary Parts, a podcast where we talk about hard things associated with the human experience with the goal of increasing awareness, growth, and healing. You may hear information from professionally licensed therapists, life coaches, healers, doctors, etc. This information is not medical advice or therapy and is not meant to replace actual therapy or instruction given by a doctor or a personal therapist. I'm your host, Jalon Johnson. My guest today is Dr. Delvina Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a nationally recognized mental health consultant, a physician, a scientist, a soldier, a mother, and a pioneer in the development of evidence-based prevention and treatment strategies. Dr. Thomas earned her undergraduate degree at Notre Dame of Maryland University, her master's in public health at Morgan State University, her medical training at the University of Maryland Medical Systems, her medical degree from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and she completed her residency at the University of Maryland and Shepherd Enoch Pratt Psychiatry Program. Dr. Thomas holds key, relation, key leadership roles with local and national congressional and community leaders, is a consulting psychiatrist for the National Football League, and she developed the Healing Heroes Mental Wellness Program, where she teaches police officers techniques to handle the stress, anxiety, depression, and other pressures that come with these critical and challenging roles in community service. Dr. Thomas is a tireless advocate working hard to end the stigma of mental illness, educate the public about the brain, and strengthen individuals, families, communities, and workplaces throughout the country. So Dr. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Anyone who wants to share mental health and wellness and have a chat about the brain and how we can all feel better and live better, I'm down. Thank you for that. Um, also, I gave a brief introduction of, of who you are, but so that the audience can get to know you better. Would you mind giving us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got to who and where you are today, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I really believe um, that it was preordained for me to to become a physician um, and as well as someone who specializes in mental health. Um, I specialize in psychiatry and neurology. Um, but before I became that, I was a mother. Um, my son was born when I was in college and undergrad. I got married in college. Um, so I am a mother before anything else. Um, I'm a daughter, a sister before anything else. I have, I'm, I'm the only girl in my family. Uh, my mother passed away in 2005 during my residency. Um, I have a father, I have two older brothers and I have a son who is, in, who is 27. Um, he just started law school and I'm very proud of him for that because it is, it's rough out here for black boys in America. Um, and actually, I, you know, I'm not saying just for black boys or black men, it's rough for all of us, all people, all minorities, people of color, but especially black men, black young men, black boys have special challenges and we know it because it's in the studies, but I don't want to derail. Let me not digress. But those are my most important functions in life is being a supportive daughter, being a supportive sister and being a mother and trying to be the best mother that I can be. Um, in addition to the things that you said, an entrepreneur, um, I opened my private practice in 2013. Uh, I have a team of about 30 people, 31, 32 people. We provide different elements of care. Um, not just medication management, not just psychotherapy, but other things to help people feel well, perform well, do well, and prevent themselves from falling into a crisis. We try to help people as much as possible. So the office also um, attends health fairs. Um, I do um, health care days for different organizations. Um, as you mentioned in my bio, the Healing Heroes for the Police Departments. Um, and also um, speaker, and I have a, a podcast as well. It's called The Brain Love Podcast. Um, it's on Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcast, and I have a YouTube channel. So I think that captures most of everything. And I'm a beginner <laughs> golfer and a traveler, and I love to eat out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. You're um, welcome. A lot of us had humble beginnings before we were able to really get into the things that make us who we are today. Um, so a question that I wanted to ask you was, what did mental health look like to you growing up um, in your Ooh. family? 
and My with God. your caregivers? I love that question. <laughs> wow. So mental health looked like I was an army brat. My father was in the army. We were not around family. I didn't grow up around my cousins. I, I come from two big families. My father's uh, parents had, I don't know, over 10 kids. My mother's um, mother and father, they um, she has, what, 12 or had 12 siblings. Um, and I had a lot of cousins, but I didn't grow up around them because my dad was in the military, so we traveled a lot. Um, so mental health for me looked like indirectly being resilient and learning how to make and meet new friends. Um, that's what mental health looked like to me. For me as a kid, and I was the youngest in my family, my brothers traveled more than I did because they lived longer. Um, but it, it looked like for me, learning how to meet kids, learning how to fit in, learning how to be friendly, learning how to be likable. Uh, so that's how it started out for me. Um, as far as my family, my dad was in the military, so we went to the gym every weekend as a family. We went to the gym on the military base on Saturday and Sundays. My dad worked out during the week, so I saw my father um, exhibit physical uh, physical health, um, take care of his body because of being a soldier. My mother, too, was um, someone who was in shape. Um, and so, but the other part of that is both of my parents are high school graduates and they come from Mississippi. So we have a lot of, um, there were a lot of stories that I would overhear my parents sharing with their brothers and sisters when they would come and visit us or when we would go and visit them. Stories of trauma, tra uh, stories of racism, them recalling things from when they were growing up. Um, mental health look like learning our history, learning our Black history. Um, our parents talked a lot about Martin Luther King Jr., um, talked a lot about Shirley Chisholm, talked a lot about um, different, just diff different Black figures in the community who made a different difference for people of color. Uh, we talked about Jim Crow. Every year we watched the Martin Luther King story. So it, it was certain things that we did in my family that, you know, was like the Black history lesson or the things that I saw indirectly as those mental health moments. And, and the one thing that um, I'll never forget is my father helped family meetings on a regular basis. We had um, we ate dinner together most evenings, but we also had a family meeting every Sunday. Um, during that meeting, he would bring us together. We would, um, you know, people would give updates, mostly my parents about, I don't even remember about what, but if there was a problem in the household, for instance, I remember being in, I want to say fifth or sixth grade, and my parents were actually contemplating divorcing. So they brought it up in the family meeting. Wow. That sounds super healthy. Um, it, and, well, I don't want to paint a picture like it was all roses and it was perfect. But you asked me, what did mental health look like? And that's what comes to mind for me. Of course, we had challenges as a family unit, but that's what mental health looked like. Right. Um, just the, the open dialogue and communication, I think your parents allowing everyone to be involved in a centered conversation that was about difficult things or just being present. Um, yeah. You know, the, the things we know about mental health now compared to what we knew then, I think that you guys still had a, a pretty decent start in learning how to communicate and to be present. So that was why yeah. I, I, I said that it looked like or it sounded like it was healthy. Yeah, kudos to my father because he was a stickler for communication, um, which mm. rubbed off on me. And when people struggle to communicate or don't communicate effectively, it's something that I try to help them with because I grew up hearing my father say, communicate, communicate. I can't read your mind. <laughs> um, or if he asked us a question, if we didn't answer that question, it was, you didn't answer my question. Think about what I just asked you and answer the question. So if anything, I think I learned being an effective communicator in my home, um, learning to listen to the other side as well as to express myself. Um, so yeah, kudos to, to my father for that. Indeed. indeed. Um, because of who you are now and what you do and how much assistance you provide for others, how does your mental and emotional health get affected by what you do now? 
Um, you know, man, I love my job. I actually wanted to be an OB guy. I wanted to do uh, women's health, but I learned quickly in medical school that I didn't have God given surgical hands. Um, it's my belief. I've said this in numerous other interviews. Certain people should have God given hands, hairstylists, makeup artists, surgeons should have God-given hands and obviously artists and painters, you know. You can always tell the difference between someone who is trying to make an opportunity with their hands versus someone who was born with a gift. Um, and so I learned quickly that it just wasn't for me. I was not going to struggle through the training and, and try to make myself into a good surgeon. So I stepped back and um, I decided, you know, after kind of mulling over different specialties. I went with psychiatry and neurology. Um, and it's because I want to help people. I have a heart for people. I don't like to see people down. I don't like to see people sad, um, especially when in a lot of instances, we have a choice that we can make. We can choose not to accept or not to embrace anger. We can choose not to embrace sadness. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions, especially when brain chemistry um, or certain mal certain malfunctions are occurring in the brain. Um, but you still can train your brain to think about and have a different perception about a situation, about a struggle you're going through. Mental health is definitely, I believe, one of the most complicated specialties in medicine. Um, and the reason being is that you are you're dealing with another person's challenges um, and, and they're not always social economic challenges. Sometimes those challenges involve the brain being diseased. The brain is just not um, it's not normal. There's not normal functioning or, or processes that are taking place. And sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. That's, um, for example, schizophrenia which is a psychotic illness where people are not in touch with reality. And so I wanted to help people, but in addition to these uh, typical mental illnesses, I won't say typical, but I'll say in addition to the main mental illnesses, the depression, the anxiety, the schizophrenia, the bipolar, there's also other subsets of pathology or diseases like substance abuse and personality disorders. And sometimes people have both. And sometimes people have three. Sometimes they have several. And it's because of how they were raised or how they were brought up, um, being neglected, not being loved, not being hugged, not being kissed, not having someone to show that they care for them. And it's because the person who's not there for them to do that didn't have the person there for them when they were growing up. So legacy is a very powerful word. Creating a legacy in most time and most conversations is a positive thing. It's about money. It's about real estate. It's about um, creating means that are ongoing that carries into different generations. But legacy can also be a, a diseased type of legacy. Parents or great grandparents or grandparents who were abused sexually, physically, emotionally, and then go on to have kids themselves. Why they freaking have kids? I don't know. Why people who come from broken families who are hurt decide to start a family and have a family when they have not managed their own emotions and don't know who they are and not comfortable and not happy, not content in life is a great question. Sometimes it's because it's an accident. Other times it's because they don't have enough insight to know that they shouldn't start a family and that they need to fix their problems. And that's why this discussion of mental health is so vital. Because I believe in former years, a lot of folks didn't know that certain things were abnormal or unacceptable or unhealthy. And so they thought, OK, I have to have a family. I have to have children. I have to get married to this person, although we don't complement each other. We're not equally yoked, although we're both broken and we're coming together and bringing two broken uh, lives and histories. And so if you have, you know. A broken this on one side of the equation and another broken this, you put them together. What is it equal? It equals broken. <laughs> so um, for me, I love what I do, but the caveat is the challenge that comes with these personality disorders, people who are um, conniving and deceitful. Uh, they come to the office. They might have an addiction. They want Xanax and Adderall together. You don't give it to them. They become demanding. They make threads. They want to post um, bad reviews. And, you know, so it is a 
it is a balance that has to be maintained and taking care of the patient, uh, doing no harm, giving them, giving them the, the healthiest treatment plan possible and trying to educate them so they are accepting. Um, people who are early in their disease of addiction, like the ones I just referenced who want certain prescription pills, um, they're not going to get it. They don't have the insight, but I feel when we address it with them and even if we don't give them the plan that they want, it's a start for them that someone has confronted them and told them, hey, I think you might have an addiction because what you're doing is not proper. So I'll say all that to say 95% of the time it's fulfilling and I love what I do. Then there's that 5% of the darkness and the evil that walks into the office and brings their spirits in when they come. And that's the part that can be a challenge for all mental health professionals. Um, and then there's also the influence of insurance and big pharma and how healthcare is managed in America, which is disgusting. The way healthcare is managed in America is disgusting. Um, and so we take most uh, healthcare plans, we take most. A lot of physicians or clinicians, and especially in mental health, don't take health insurance at all. And I have an appreciation for why they've chosen not to. It's because health insurance plans make it very cumbersome, very challenging, very difficult. Health care is not affordable for a lot of Americans. And so some people choose plans that have high deductibles. They can't afford to pay the deductible. They show up to you, they want an appointment, and they're not forthcoming and saying that they have a deductible. So you have to pay someone who's verifying the insurance for these appointments to determine what the person should pay. When you tell them what they should pay, some of them don't want to pay because I have a mental illness. You should just treat me for free. So there's that balance of helping people, running a business, running a successful business, um, and not selling yourself out. I hope that I answered the question. I agree with you. <laughs> you did. You did. Thank you. Um, I think it's so difficult to want to help people and to have a passion to do it, but then to have to deal with, you know, things like you mentioned, like the, the healthcare industry, how it makes it so difficult and so hard. Um, and then you have people who, you know, have been enabled by the system or, um, you know, like you said, they'll leave a bad review if you don't do the, the things that they want. So it, it can kind of put you in a bind. So I appreciate you standing up and, and doing what you feel is right and trying to help people in the best way that you can. Thank you. Thank you. And and if you don't mind, I want to add on to that answer. Um, sure. America, well, there's this thing called the rat race. And I guess this exists in other countries as well, because um, NPR had a story on regarding the best countries to retire in or the, the countries with the best retirement system. And America was not in the top three, I don't think, or it might have been the third one. I can't recall. It was in the top five. So what we've been taught in life is that you work until you're 65 and now the age has been changed to 67, 68, and they're recommending people work until they're 70 so they can take care of themselves and pay into social security. And, you know, but when you think about life expectancy, the average life expectancy rate or age for men is 73, 74. I haven't looked at the most updated numbers, but for women, it's somewhere around 74, 75, 76. But the point I'm making is we're expected to live 10 years, but if we take the new social security age, we're expected to live eight years past social security. So you work, most people probably started working in their teenage years in high school, maybe most, maybe some people didn't start until they graduated college, but you work for 30 to 40 years, some people for 50 years to get a freaking $2,000, $3,000 check each month to live for another eight years. Do the math on how much time, how much money you paid into this system over these years just to get this little bit of money that they don't want to give you until you're 70 years old. Unless, of course, obviously you worked for an agency, the government, you created a pension or whatever. If you've done something like that, great. That's awesome. But think about the Americans who haven't because they didn't have the knowledge to do it. 
They weren't raised by a parent who worked for the government or worked for some agency or taught them about retirement. So when you think about it and you look at the big picture, the, the rat race tells you to work all your life. So when I was in um, eighth grade, I remember watching my father and, and, and seeing my father prepare for retirement. He was in the army. He retired, um, uh, began working for the sheriff's department. So he got a second retirement. And I make notes to myself. I want retirement plans. I want pension. I want to stash money. I want real estate so I can have something to fall back on. I can't rely on Social Security. And I also don't want to work until I'm 65, 70. So being in this field, leaving the field is not about the 5% of those challenges I described, but it's about having quality of life and feeling like I can live and relax and just, and just be and not feeling like I have to go to someone's job, even though it's my company. Um, because if you're a good boss to yourself, you still hold yourself accountable and you still got rules. You got a schedule you have to keep. Although you're the boss, you still want to do it. So I just wanted to mention um, this whole notion of the rat race and working until we're 70 years old. Think about that, people. You have less than 10 years left, but people are living a lot longer, granted. So this is why it's so important to take care of yourself now, to know how to deal with stress, to know how not to develop things like diabetes, which is high blood sugar, not to develop high blood pressure, not to have a heart attack or a stroke, so that when you get older, your medical, your physical burdens are a lot less. Because imagine you have less money to live off of. So that means less money for pharmaceuticals, less money for medical care, less money for doctor's visits, or you're spending all your money to do those things and have less money to travel or to do things that are fun. So sorry about that uh, digression, but I just want to <laughs> include that in there too, because we're talking about health, livelihood, and mental. And, and mental. So that's right. important. Right. No need to apologize. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask a question to to kind of give a little bit of um, awareness between the difference of what mm -hmm. a therapist is and a psychiatrist is. So can you tell me what the difference is? Yeah, the biggest difference is that um, a psychiatrist is a physician. We're medical doctors. We go to medical school. We don't go to graduate school. Um, we go to medical school after graduating college. Most of us will go to college and graduate and get an undergraduate degree. You can attend medical school and just get the prerequisites. It's about three years of work you have to do. So most people will just do that extra year and get and get their bachelor's. So that way they have something to fall back on if medical school doesn't work out. So medical school is four years. You become you become a physician. That means you can treat whatever you want, pretty much, because um, at that point. Well, I, let me back up. I shouldn't say you can treat whatever you want. You have to do additional training called an internship. So after you graduate medical school, you do a year of internship that makes you a general practitioner. At that point, you can treat whatever you want. Um, and so obviously it's not recommended if you haven't done the training or residency to become a specialist in, let's say, treating HIV or cancer. So saying you can treat whatever you want is a loose way to say you can treat colds, high blood pressure, um, high blood sugar, basic medical type diseases, um, things that are more specialized require you to go to residency. Um, so you have to do additional years past that one year of internship to become a specialist. So a lot of people know about OB-GYNs. OB-GYNs do four years of residency to be able to um, offer uh, women's health care, deliver babies, perform uh, tubal ligations, hysterectomies. Some people will do three years of internal medicine. That's a primary care physician for adults. Some people will do three years of training to become a pediatrician. Psychiatry and neurology requires four years of additional training. So you do your one year of internship and then you do three years of residency in psychiatry and neurology. And it includes emergency medicine, a lot of neurology, a lot of um, internal medicine stuff, rounding in the hospital on basic medicine patients in addition to your psychiatry um, foundation. So psychiatrists are physicians. Um, we can be MDs or DOs because there are two different types of medical schools. There's allopathic and osteopathic. Once you finish um, your residency, then you're considered a psychiatrist. You take an exam to become board certified. 
So I present myself as board certified psychiatrist or board certified in psychiatry and neurology. The other uh, side of the house and mental health uh, therapist would be a psychologist. A psychologist attends college. They go to graduate school for four years to get a PhD or a PsyD because there's two different degrees you can get as a psychologist as well. Um, and then they can become a clinical psychologist. So uh, see patients, conduct uh, psychotherapy with them. Some of them would do testing, neuropsychological testing. So they do a little bit of extra training to help with that. Some will become forensic psychologists. That would be someone who um, does uh, conducts evaluations for people of, accused of crimes, or maybe they work in a prison system, which, by the way, is where I worked for about eight years before I opened my private practice, right after coming out of residency. Um, and then the other types of therapists are master's degree levels, like right? there's licensed clinical social workers. That person goes to um, undergrad, goes to college, and they do two years of graduate school, and they get a master's in social work and take an exam to become a licensed clinical social worker. There's a licensed mental health counselor and LMHC. Same thing, two years of graduate studies. And then those people, if they want, anyone can go and get a PhD in anything. You can get a PhD in math, a PhD in English, a PhD in social work, a PhD in nursing. Um, so if you get a PhD, you can put the letters DR in front of your name. So you would be Dr. Johnson if you went and got a PhD. So if we're all being referred to as doctor, you're thinking, okay, a doctor of what? So that's why you would ask, ask your uh, practitioner for their credentials. You're a doctor of, you know, are you a medical doctor or are you a, a social worker who has a, a, a doctorate degree or are you um, someone who has a PhD in psychology? So it's important to ask for those additional credentials so you know who, who's treating you. So that's the biggest difference. And one um, specialty I left out, LMFTs, licensed marriage and family therapists, also are considered therapists. Um, and different states will have other types of um, um, disciplines that qualify to be therapists. Like I think in Maryland, they have LPCs, licensed professional counselors, I think is what they call it. That's someone with a, a two year, a master's degree as well. So it depends on where you live and how they denote it or how they uh, refer to um, the, um, um, the, the profession. Um, but LCSW is everywhere. That's a, just like how uh, medical doctors, everywhere. Just like psychologists, everywhere. But some states don't have LMHCs. They have something else. But LCSWs are, that's a ubiquitous, that's everywhere. So a licensed clinical social worker is, is just that. So that's the difference. So those folks can't treat, can't um, prescribe, um, they can't um, create treatment plans that include medications. Um, although, because some areas are so underserved with psychiatrists, the system has created, um, especially like on Indian reservations, psychologists have been granted the privilege to prescribe only psychiatry medications. They can't prescribe, like I can prescribe any medicine, um, but a, a prescribing psychologist in certain states, I believe there's two states in America um, that allow this and these uh, states are very rural. They're very underserved. Um, so in some places there's an exception for psychologists to prescribe. And there's also, um, there's it's not so new, it's been around for a while, but there's some, something called psychiatric nurse practitioners or nurse practitioners, family nurse practitioners as well. These are nurses who have a bachelor, bachelor's degree. They go and get a master's like the therapist will do to learn a certain specialty. And now they have prescribing privileges. And every state um, has their own laws and rules about what a, a nurse practitioner can do, or if the nurse practitioner has to work under a physician, or if they can work independently. So, whew, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Thank you. But it was very detailed. And I think if there was any um, misconception about what one is from the other, you covered it. So, thank you for that. <clears throat> You're welcome. Now, because the main topic of what I wanted to cover was mental health. I wanted to ask you, in your professional opinion, based on your experience, mm -hmm. how would you define mental health? Like, mental what is health. mental health? Sure. 
um, mental health is having balance um, and how you manage yourself emotionally, how you interact with others. Um, it's emotional fitness and wellness. Um, and period, I would put a period there. Okay. What would be some common symptoms that someone would be able to recognize to say that maybe they're struggling with their mental health? Yeah. So I mentioned e emotional balance and interactions with people. When someone has um, a compromised ability to socialize or interact with others, that is a sign that they're having mental health challenges. So mental health is about that emotional balance as well as social well-being. They'll say also psychological well-being, but what is psychological well-being, you know? Psychological well-being is emotional balance. Um, so some of the signs that you'll see when someone is, uh, when their mental health is challenged is that they don't get along with people. Um, and in every situation, they are the common denominator. They're the problem. Um, it, it's someone who does not know how to treat other people. Um, and I'm, that's, that's just very basic because that doesn't mean you have a mental illness, but it does. It, th those are kind of some red flags. Um, the other thing, when we're talking about more serious, formal type of mental illnesses, signs that someone is not doing well men mentally is that they're crying all the time. They're sad consistently. They're always nervous or uneasy or anxious. They feel overwhelmed a lot and they don't know what to do. Um, and so it's not enough to just experience the symptoms, but these symptoms have to also interfere with their daily functioning. So for someone to be diagnosed with an actual mental illness, they have to have the symptoms and the symptoms rise to a level of disrupting their daily routine. And also it's not caused by a physical or medical condition, which is why when someone presents certain types of presentations for the first time, your psychiatrist may say, hey, we should do a brain CT or a head CT, or they'll want to order some blood work um, to check out your thyroid level, to check your cortisol level, to check certain things um, in the blood to ensure those things are normal. Because sometimes when physical things are happening, it presents like a mental health issue. Something that can, well, thank you for that. That was a, a very good explanation. Um, something that can affect our mental health, especially today, we're seeing so much more of it because it's been recognized is trauma. Um, yeah. So how would you define trauma and what are some symptoms that you would see that are associated with trauma and how it affects our mental health? Sure. So the first thing I'll say about trauma is that no one can tell you what is traumatic for you. Um, sometimes people will try to say, and I've seen this from other professionals, oh, why was this person diagnosed with a trauma disorder? That's, that's not traumatizing or that's not traumatic. You can't define for another person what's traumatic for them. That's the first thing. So um, trauma is our response to an event that's very unsettling. Um, and it overwhelms our ability to cope. So it could be, for example, the death of a family member. It could be being robbed, whether at gunpoint or not. Um, it could be an interaction with a police officer. It could be um, domestic violence happening in the household and, and the children are seeing it, if they're around it. That could be traumatizing for the children, not just for the abuser and the victim. Um, trauma could be um, 9 11 was traumatic for a lot of Americans, you know, watching those buildings sure. fall, watching people jump off the building, the buildings, hearing the calls from people calling to families, telling them they love them. You know, that is one of the most vicarious traumas that comes to mind for me because trauma does not have to be something a person personally experiences. There are or there is such a thing as vicarious trauma. So it's being a witness. Um, you and I were talking before we started recording, the George Floyd incident was traumatizing for many 
many Americans and not just black Americans or people of color, but also um, some of the majority were traumatized by what they saw too. And for the ones who did not acknowledge racism in America, George Floyd forced them to look themselves in the face and admit that we have a problem in America. Ahmaud Arbery was traumatic for a lot of people. Um, so trauma is something that um, overwhelms you. Um, it compromises your, your usual ability to cope. Um, and it's an emotional response that someone has to um, something that occurs around them. It doesn't have to occur, occur to them or involve them. Can trauma affect the brain or brain development? I cannot knock my head up and down, north, south, <laughs> more than what I'm doing. Trauma is a brain wrecker. If the trauma is unsettling for that person and it is a traumatizing experience for them, the brain can develop so many um, challenges or abnormalities because of the effect that that trauma has had on the person. Um, and what do I mean by that? When we're overwhelmed or when we're stressed, our brain can respond in ways that changes the typical um, physiology. Um, it changes the way the brain functions. Maybe the brain is not uh, pumping out as many chemicals as it typically would, you know, the dopamine and the serotonin, or maybe it's they're, they're being generated, but when they get to the door, when they get to the place of the brain, um, I always call this the door. These are the receptor sites. So we make these chemicals and the chemicals have to go somewhere. That somewhere, they have to get inside that somewhere. They get inside through the receptor and that's akin to a door. So they go up to the door. They're knocking on the door. The door opens. They go in and do what they're supposed to do. There are so many different functions happening in the brain simultaneously, even when we're sleeping. So when stress and trauma happens, these things are disrupted. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. I was just having a conversation with a colleague yesterday about a patient who, it's a, a teenager, a very, very unsettled child. Um, and I asked my colleague, does she have any history of trauma? Was she abused growing up? Was she sexually abused? Was she physically abused? And that they know of, no, she grew up in a loving family, her father was was um, someone who does not believe in mental health, so he never he didn't really say the supportive type stuff. But she had a mother there, her mother there, um, to to counter those things. But she was not abused allegedly. But when you see people who are so unsettled in life, overwhelmed, stressed, anxious, they hate themselves, they're crying all the time, they're cutting themselves, they're burning themselves. Um, they think about dying or wanting to commit suicide a lot. Oftentimes, the root of that is trauma as a child. It's what has happened in a person's childhood um, that creates this manifestation of these mental health challenges and these mental illnesses. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for asking that question, um, because I think a lot of times we see symptoms and Doctors will want to treat the symptoms, but they, they will never probe into what the root cause may be. And as we're learning more and more about trauma and how it affects the brain, like you said, they could have, they could have been some sexual abuse when they were little, or they could have had something that disrupted their normal nervous system and brain function. And as a result of that, they're having these symptoms. So that was why I felt it was important to ask you that question about trauma because of what you do. And I love the fact that you do use that question when you're doing intake. So thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, something that we spoke about a little bit was trauma and mental health in the black and brown communities. And not to exclude anyone else, um, like you mentioned, but also we are black and brown. So that's something that we can talk about. Um, and it's something that I choose to talk about often because I feel like it's not done enough. Um, and I also feel like mental health and emotional health wasn't something that our parents and grandparents and our, you know, our ancestors 
had a lot of knowledge about or, you know, it was just something that was put on the back burner. So I wanted to ask you your opinion. Why do you feel like it was something that wasn't given a lot of attention? And what things do you see nowadays that are indications of that in black and brown communities? That are indications of of what in particular? Mental health being put on the back burner or not being something that was addressed and important. Gotcha. So the first part of the question, why did we put it on the back burner? Because we didn't know. For so long, Black people didn't even know how to read. We didn't know how to read. Um, For quite some time, we didn't have access to health insurance or life insurance. Um, We've been held down, pushed down, suppressed, repressed. And so a lot of what we don't know comes from what the majority did to us during these several hundred years of slavery and uh, Jim Crow. And although slavery ended, it continued. They just found a different way to, to present it. It became Jim Crow. And so when survival is your primary goal, putting food on the table, clothes on your back, and oftentimes no shoes on their feet, but a roof over your head, there's no time to think about anything else because you're so focused on surviving. Um, our people, we are we are black gold. We are descendants of slaves. And because of being so resilient and overcoming the things that we've overcome, I think it has handicapped some of our, our elders, some of our um, great grandparents and grandparents because they may do with what they had. And complaining was not an option. Imagine asking, you know, I don't know, a a male slave or a female slave, um, or if people prefer a man or a woman slave, um, their thoughts on taking care of themselves mentally or what would they do? They, They probably wouldn't have an answer because, again, the focus was survival. Um. And survival means that certain things get prioritized and certain things are not. But I'll tell you, the resilience that was created during slavery, um, a lot of that had to do with God and Christianity and having a higher power and believing in a higher power. It was those hymns and and songs that they sang. Um, It was the unity. It was the, the collectiveness. It was taking care of one another, looking out for one another. It was being together on Sundays for church. It was, you know, singing together and praying together. So that is why Christianity and church and religion has such a stronghold in the black community, because for so long, it's it is what held us down. With all things comes change. So as we became more educated, fought our way to get access, more access to things like health insurance and life insurance and have more money. From that point, we were able to say, okay, what else can I do besides church to help myself? And for so long, mental health treatment was seen as a white man's courtesy or as something only for white folks, something that only they could afford. And you really didn't hear about mental health care um, Uh, when you talked about insurance, when there was a discussion about health insurance, health insurance, those those uh, dialogues are more about physical health and less about mental health. In the beginning, there were plans that didn't even have mental health benefits, no mental health benefits. You couldn't get admitted to a hospital and the health insurance cover it. You couldn't get substance abuse treatment. Um, They didn't cover certain psychiatric medications. So we had to have change and reform in all of these areas. Now that we know better, um, I don't want to fast forward quickly yet to social media, but that in between was learning and, and, and finding out about stuff because, you know, the man liked to keep things hidden from us. So we had, we had to figure it out on our own, just like so many other things. Um, and so when people like Oprah Winfrey brought on Dr. Phil, who's a psychologist, to talk about mental challenges, you know, it's kind of like, hmm, Oprah Winfrey and, and a psychologist, albeit he was a white psychologist, but he was, this, is, you know, a psychologist. So 
until something becomes more mainstream or we see someone we look up to doing it or some celebrity or, or athlete doing it, it doesn't occur to some of us. And I think as people become more knowledgeable, they fear less accessing the services. And because we've tried to normalize it, um, definitely during COVID, mental health was the thing to do. Like so many people, there are some people who change their careers to become mental health professionals or to become coaches. Um, and, and sometimes, a lot of times it's driven by money and it's not driven by the passion to help other people. Um, so hopefully that answers your question as to why um, black, black and brown people did not access um, or didn't talk about mental health care to begin with. Um, long story short, I don't think they thought it was an option. Um, and then, you know, within black and brown people, you also have Caribbean folks. And there are still a lot of Caribbeans who don't believe in mental health treatment. It's still stigmatized in their community. Um, and some indications now of mental health being on the back burner, um, it's still the people who are old school. It's still the people who says, just pray on it. You just need Jesus, you know. Um, oh, if you wouldn't do this or do that, you wouldn't have these mental health challenges. Um, so that's evidence that it's on the back burner. But we have a lot of preachers and pastors and ministers who are telling their congregations, you can pray and go to therapy. You can do both. So they're trying to trying to normalize that. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> that was so good. Thank you for that. Um, I think you covered literally anything that could be a reason why mental health wasn't something that um was talked about was popular you know the stigmas behind it so many things um i i kind of just got lost listening to you but it was it was a great answer and you can tell that you are super knowledgeable and that you know what you're talking about so thank you for that um oh, one thing I, I wanted to clarity when you say you got lost what does that mean just listening to li listening to what you were saying, like I, I just I was in the moment, not lost as in I was somewhere else, but like I was just so zoned in on it, like I my attention was completely there. So that's what I meant yeah. by that. Okay, just wanted to clarify. <laughs> Do you think that black men in particular struggle with their mental health? Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Y'all struggle. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like that is? Because I know you 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 have a lot of content on that, and you do um, presentations on it as well. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that if you like. Yeah. So I told you I have all men in my life, and um, man, mm -hmm. that my two right. older brothers, my son. And also I have a lot of, a lot of black male patients. Um, and growing up, I had a, a lot of black, um, a lot of guy friends who happen to be black because I'm black <laughs> and just having honest conversations <laughs> with them. I think uh, in a lot of circumstances, the root of the problem is the childhood, it's the child rearing, it's the father who wasn't there. Hmm. I, the community I know best is my own community. This might happen in the white community. This might happen in the Navajo community. This might happen in the Hispanic community, but I don't know that community. I know my community the best. And I know too many situations and circumstances right. where fathers don't show up. Black fathers don't show up for their kids. Now, if you're listening to this and you're saying, oh, we show up. I have friends, they do this and do this. The women, it's their fault. We, you know, you, you have a rebuttal. I'm telling you about my experience and what I know and what I've seen. When a young girl is crying herself to sleep every night because she doesn't know where her father is, she hasn't spoken to him in over two years, or because a, a young man, a young boy doesn't see his father because he comes once a year or once every other year or doesn't come at all. I know those stories and they exist. Thank you for the fathers who do, who do show up. But for the fathers who don't, just know you are creating a, a person who will have mental challenges, 
who will be unsatisfied, dissatisfied in life. In most cases, there are some exceptions. I have family members who didn't have a father growing up at all, and their mother held it down. She had six kids. They all went to college. They are all productive people. That balance, though, was the rest of the family. The balance was the other, the uncles who stepped in. It was the older cousins who stepped in. It was the people who stepped in financially to assist. But when you don't have that, it creates a challenge for that person. Um, there are, are exceptions to every rule. Um, the other thing is, it's about love too. Love should be at the root of everything that we do. But when you're not raised to know love and understand love, and there's no conversation about love, you know, what is love? When that conversation is not taking place and there's no hugs and there's no kisses, you, you really don't have a good sense of who you are and what you should do. And I think for some black men, because there's this whole machismo um, status that they want to achieve and maintain, they don't allow themselves to cry. They don't allow themselves to feel. They don't allow themselves to say, I love you or kiss their son um, or kiss their father. So I, I think those are the things that are missing. Now, I will say I have plenty of friends who have children and they love on their kids, black men. They love on their children. They are great fathers. So obviously the, the former, the situation I described first is not the situation for all cases, but there should not be any case of that. Um, and it's what I said in the beginning. We have cases of these types of things because of people not being raised, people not being reared, and then they go on to have kids. So, yeah, um, and, and I don't want to put too much out there because you guys have to come to my event in person. The next men's mental health panel is Monday, November 6th at the YMCA in Historic Cistronk. We start at 6 o'clock with networking and a happy hour, and the show starts at 7, 7.15. And these are the types of questions that we ask. And if you go on my YouTube channel, which is Dr. Delvina Thomas, the recordings from part one, which was in June, um, and part two, which was in July, those two shows are on my YouTube channel. And part three, again, is taking place November 6th. So you're a Black man. What do you think? Do you guys struggle with mental, um, typical mental health type uh, I'll say balance, or do you think black men have difficulties with mental health and wellness? Of course, hundred percent. Um, that was why this was so important for me to to have conversations like this and to start therapy. I remember starting therapy for me was like it was so scary because I didn't have any safety emotionally. So for me to have to sit with someone and talk about my feelings and talk about my trauma and, and, you know, things that I had gone through, it felt like I had to get undressed in front of a stranger. Um, but I'm glad I did it. And as a result of that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do more and have these conversations because I think it's so important that we talk about our childhoods and we talk about the fact that maybe we, you know, didn't get love or our parents got divorced or any number of things, just being black in this country is traumatic for, for black men. So being able to have conversations about it and talk about it is so emotionally healthy and it, it does so much for us to unburden so much that we carry and we feel lighter just from having, you know, a conversation. We may say, you know, I, I felt like this for so long, but if you hold that in and you don't have an outlet for it, it's going to get heavy. And then if you, you know, it's it's just like carrying a backpack with all of your the weight of the world in it. And once you can take that off, you feel so much lighter and it gives you so much more room and space to do other things, be a yeah. better father, to be a better husband, to be better at so many different things. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. Um, another thing I wanted to ask is what is DRT Brain Love Foundation? That is um, a nonprofit. My office started in 2018, um, and we created this foundation to try and help patients fill in the financial gap. You have to qualify for it, of course, financially, um, and you have to share with us that you're having a mental health challenge. Um, at times, we offer you know a certain amount of sessions of psychotherapy for someone who doesn't have insurance or does not have the ability to pay for it. There are times when a patient will tell me, like yesterday, Hey, I'm having financial issues. I can't pay my copay today. 
thank you for telling me. If you would not have told me, we wouldn't have known. We can help you. We'll waive your copay. So we're able to pull funds from the foundation to help that person. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a foundation that we created to fill in those financial gaps to help people access mental health care. Um, and sometimes we use it so that we can assist another foundation perform um, some sort of community service or give back, such as in December, we're going to um, a women's clinic in Jamaica. Um, they're very underserved there. They don't have any mental health professionals. So myself and, and some of my clinicians are going over to do a mental health day. So it's, it's our way of giving back as well as educating and helping with prevention and treatment. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Can you talk a little bit about, a little bit about the Healing Heroes Mental Wellness Program? Yeah, um, the well, the former chief of police now asked me to assist uh, with creating a mental health program um, in North Miami Beach. Uh, I also created a program in North Miami. Uh, for Chief Larry, who's no longer the chief. Now they have their a black woman chief there. Shout out to, um, to their new chief. But we created a program to try to destigmatize mental illness um, in the police departments um, because I'm in the military also, as I mentioned. Um, there was a huge stigma of mental illness in the military and the same in law enforcement. So it was a way to educate them. So when they're out in the community, they kind of um, have some basic knowledge of what they might see of someone who is autistic or schizophrenic is having um, or in crisis, right? So we, you just can't go around shooting everyone who's in a mental health crisis. So you want them to be aware. So you teach them because that's not something they learn in the academy, but also in teaching them what they might see in the community, you talk to them about their own mental health. You talk to them about insomnia, about traumas, about how to manage stress, about depression, anxiety. Um, so it was a program that was created to help them recognize certain things in the community and also to recognize things in themselves and um, teaching them about the ways to prevent it and what they can do if they're in that experience. That's got to be rewarding, especially because that's such a, a high stress job. Um, the dangers that um, cops face every day when they go out into the field. Yeah. I know that it's got to be it's got to be difficult for them to feel like their mental health, it may not, especially if they don't really know about mental health, you know, they, they just yeah. may be confused about how they're feeling. Um, yeah. Have you gotten any feedback from, from any of the officers that have been in the program? Yeah. Well, feedback is them coming here <laughs> and that's feedback. Mm. You know, they want to become right. patient. So yeah. Um, and a lot of them enjoy the classes. Um not to brag on myself, but I'm a very dynamic presenter. Um, you will not fall asleep. And if you're someone, some of them did not want to take the classes. They didn't want to participate. But by the time we, and it, it, the different departments, I think for one uh, program, it was like 8 a.m. to one o'clock. Another one was eight to four. It was all day thing. But for both, mm -hmm. by the time we finished that first hour, they were based, they were engaged and they were happy they were there because both of the police departments made it a requirement for them to participate. That's great. Thank you for that as well. Yeah. Um, what's it, what's it like being a consulting psychiatrist for the NFL? Um, so it's a, it's substance abuse, um, consultant and, it's not very busy because the NFL does not like referring folks who beyond a therapist, they want to keep it at the lowest level. The lowest level is psychotherapy. Psychiatrists are utilized more so for the medication management. I see. Um, I'm sure there's got to be a lot of a lot of things that you see dealing with NFL players, even if it's just CTE or um, having having to come from a humble beginning and then now you have this huge contract and trying to balance just life with that huge change and the pressure of performing every week. Um, so I know that mental health is something that is probably big that maybe isn't addressed enough in the NFL. 
Yeah, and more most of the the patients I have who are professional athletes, um, a lot of them are retired, and we have that conversation about what life was like when they were a player. Um, I also do some mental health, um, not uh, mental health teaching for a financial program. It's called Team One Hundred. Team One Hundred addresses um, financial. Um, financial intellect. Um, they are trying to teach athletes, college and professional about finances, and we have a mental health component. So I run the mental health component for that. So in doing so, it's it's not clinical treatment, but it's more so classes and um, group discussions and group therapy and having those discussions discussions about finances and how mental health plays into it. So it it is for someone who goes from rags to riches, you know, in right. years or 20 years, it can be a bit overwhelming. To say the least. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to ask a personal question. As a mental health expert, what do you wish to accomplish most? Uh, knowing that I taught people that you can have lemons, but make lemonade. That you don't have to be stuck in a rut. Even when things are not going well, um, it's still okay. Teaching people that they can think out of the box and that there's always something you can do differently. Um, you know, I've encouraged a couple of people to move out of South Florida because it was too expensive and they had financial burdens and financial challenges. They weren't happy. And I said to them, but why do you still live here? Why don't you move? And they're so much happier. They moved to a different area. There are so many places to live in America. So think outside of the box when you have a problem or you have a stressor. Um, so I want people to know that they can make lemonade with their lemons. That's great. All right. Now, last question. If you could use your platform to encourage someone who may be struggling with their mental health or with their big feelings, um, and they're they're kind of on the fence about talking to somebody or they're just scared to, what would you say to them? I would say, try it. We should try anything. Um, give it a chance. I would also tell them not to allow that first experience to influence the entire experience because, you know, therapists and mental health professionals are people. We are people too. That means we have brains, we have personalities. Um, so it's possible that you may not click with your first therapist or your first mental health provider. Um, and if you don't, it's okay. Just tell the person, hey, I, I, wanna, I, I think I want to try a different office or a different person. No one's going to get upset with that. We all know that. We all know it. It's, it's better to have that conversation and, and to just you know, let them know that you want to try a different, a different mental health professional or you want to try a different modality. Um, and things will be okay. So you don't have to be afraid of it. No one's going to hurt you. People just want to help you. Um, so try it the one time and you don't, you should not wait until you're in crisis. You should do it beforehand. Prevention is key. So don't wait until you're in a crisis because think about it. If you're in crisis, that mental health professional, they don't know what you're really like at your baseline. When you go to someone in crisis, you're a totally different person than who you are when things are balanced are pretty okay. So I would say to have a mental health professional on your treatment team, you got to have a primary care physician, have a mental health professional too. Go on psychologytoday.com or um, what is it? Black Girls Therapy. There's also a site for... Um, Black psychiatrist, you can go on the American Psychiatric Association, you can go on Google and put in Black mental health professionals in my area, and something will come up. So you'll have something to work from and to choose a person. And you could call and say, hey, I just I just want uh, someone who's on my, my medical team who's a mental health professional. I don't have a problem right now. I can come in for an assessment or I can do a virtual assessment. We can see how it goes. And you never know. You'll probably probably really like the interaction and the processing and decide, I think I want to do this twice a month or once a month. Your health insurance pays for it. So why not? That was great advice. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for this. Um, 
This has been a, a wonderful conversation and I think you really did an amazing job of showcasing your talent and your expertise and that's why you're known as a mental health expert. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. If people want to find you online or social media, where can they find you? On Instagram and Facebook and um, what is that other thing called? TikTok, which I don't really use, but <laughs> on all those platforms, I'm Dr. Delvina, which is D-R, D as in Delta, E-L, V as in Victor, E-N as in November, A as in Alpha. Uh, my company is DRT Brain Love on Instagram and uh, Facebook and TikTok. Uh, my last name is Thomas. So Dr. Delvina Thomas um, is my YouTube channel. And please subscribe and, and follow my podcast, which is the Brain Love Podcast. It's on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Apple. Follow. It's been on since May 2020. Mother's Day was the first episode in 2020 during the during the pandemic. All right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing all your information, and thank you for um, seeing value on what I'm trying to do and and being a guest on the show to give everybody yeah. the tools and knowledge and everything that you provide with what you do. So, thank you for this. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do and for how you do it. You're welcome. You're very welcome. It's a, it's a blessing to be here.